Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? The subject of this episode is hate crime. Zahida Mallard, Equality and Engagement Manager at South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, talks to the Deputy Chief Crown Prosecutor for Yorkshire and Humberside, Gail Gilchrist, and Inspector Richard Clare from West Yorkshire Police. to define for us what hate crime is and then also talk about hate incidents Richard. Yes I'll start off just by just reading out the definitions of what a hate incident is and what a hate crime is. There is a subtle difference which I'll explain but basically the wording is almost identical for both. So if I start off with a hate incident, a hate incident is any incident reported which is perceived by the victim or any other person to be motivated by hostility or prejudice based on a person's disability, race, religion, sexual orientation or gender identity. And the only difference between a hate incident and a hate crime is that a hate crime is any criminal offence as opposed to an incident. There's not many incidents that aren't also crimes. So incident is an overriding definition we use for anything that gets reported as hate, but the vast majority nowadays are classed as criminal offences. Another aspect of it is perceived by the victim or any other person. So we will never ask someone to explain why they think they are a hate victim. It's their own individual perception. Now, sometimes we might query that ourselves, but we're not allowed to ask them to explain or challenge why that perception is there. Perception is quite an important aspect of it because there might be no obvious reason why they perceive themselves to be a victim of hate crime. So just as an example of that, um, a few years ago, we had a number of cars damaged at the side of the road. There was about 14 that had the wing mirrors kicked off. It was a, a route from a local pub to a local housing estate that often suffered damage. So we went around all the houses, taking the crime reports off the people whose cars had been damaged. And about halfway down that street, there was an Asian female whose car had had the wing mirror taken off. And when we spoke to her, she said, oh, yes, I've had my car damaged. And it's because I'm Asian. That's the reason why I've had my car damaged. So that was recorded as a hate crime for that particular lady. Bearing in mind, there was 13 other cars on the street that were not recorded as hate crimes. Now, we could turn around and say that we don't think it was a hate crime because why would the other 13 that are owned by white people also be damaged? But we're not in a position to challenge it. So that, when it comes down to investigating crimes, is an important concept to grasp, is the perception aspect of it. So that's perceived by the victim or any other person, and it's perceived to be motivated by hostility or prejudice. So the idea there is that we're thinking the incident or the crime has only happened because of hostility or prejudice against that person for one of the particular strands. So the strands that we look at are specified. They are disability, they are race, they are religion, sexual orientation or gender identity. So it's only those five things that will make us class it as a hate crime or a hate incident. Just a, a final line between the incident and crime then is uh, crimes are fairly obvious. They're all defined in regulations and law as to what would be a criminal offence. Um, and as I said, there's not many things now that would be classed as an incident, not as a crime. It could be that uh, one of the most regular ones we have is where somebody's on a bus, uh, a member of the public walks past and says something like, uh, go back home or go back to where you came from and then gets off the bus. There's no swearing involved. There's no abuse as such involved. There's no violence. But the person who receives that comment could quite rightly say that was a hate incident. I take that as an offensive comment about me going back home. So that as a particular example could be classed as an incident, not necessarily a crime, depending on the circumstances. It could be someone's been refused service in a shop or someone's been told that something's out of stock. They might perceive that as being down to their ethnicity, down to their race, down to their orientation, even without any words being associated with it to link it to that. And the last example I give is a fairly recent one of someone who failed a driving test without any other surrounding information to it. They said, I failed my driving test because they are biased against me because I am black and therefore um, a hate incident will be recorded in those circumstances. So that just hopefully just defines the difference between a hate crime and a hate incident. 
following on from that, Richard, can I just why you think hate incidents would be good to be reported or to be logged from a police perspective or a community perspective? Yeah, we've spent a number of years now actively encouraging people to report hate crimes and hate incidents to us. And we realise that not all of those can be followed through, not all of those will end up in prosecutions, as we will probably be discussing later. But for us, if people don't tell us what's going on, then there's no chance for us to do anything about it. We need to build up that intelligence picture. We need to realise what is going on in the community. We need to realise what is affecting people. Now, we've been actively going out to certain groups, encouraging them to report. Most recently, that has been uh, for disability and trans. Now, I went on a meeting a couple of years ago where there was a member of the trans community there and we discussed trans crime and I said, oh, there's very little trans crime uh, where we work in Wakefield. We'd only had 10 incidents reported in a year. And the person turned around and said, well, actually, I'm part of a trans group within this area. And I can tell you, we probably have 10 incidents reported to our group a week. For me, that was a massive eye opener that there is offences being committed against certain groups of people that for whatever reason don't tell us. Now, unless they tell us, we don't realise that we have a problem and only then can we start acting on it. So we've always encouraged people, for whatever reason, to tell us what's been going on. We don't pressurise people into prosecuting. We don't ring people back all the time unless they want us to. But without that intelligence picture, we wouldn't be aware of perhaps um, incidents in certain communities, certain groups having offences committed against them. Uh, and we would be running blind if we didn't have that information. Just going on from there, I think it's really important that um, the public understand that it's not for them to decide whether something that's happened is a crime, a hate crime or a hate incident. They don't need to worry about that. If they feel that something like that has been committed, then they still must report it. And that links into what Richard has just been saying. They shouldn't worry about whether or not they should be wasting the police time or, or anything like that. It's not for them to think, well, is this a crime? Isn't it a crime? they report it and both the Crime Prosecution Service and the police um, have to treat that as a hate crime. We both work with the same definition of a hate crime and if the police investigate an incident as such, a crime as a hate crime um, and there's sufficient evidence and it's in the public interest, they will then send it through to the Crime Prosecution Service. But it, it is really very much about raising the awareness and people not being frightened of reporting and letting them know also that there is support there for them. Yeah, it's important about the awareness because we spent a lot of time working with disability over the last 12 months and a number of people didn't realise that they could be victims of hate crime, particularly things like mental health disabilities where particularly during COVID in the early days of that, there was a number of comments made against people with learning difficulties, people not abiding by the regulations. And it was only the work we'd done to raise that awareness that they even thought of reporting it to us, because it was one of those things where if you don't know you've been offended against, you don't report it. So it's quite important for us to make sure that people are aware about the protections that are in place for them, the work that we will do, some of the support that we can offer, um, and make sure that they tell us when things are happening. It's really interesting that you're saying that, Richard, because um, when, you know, we're looking at data and information on reporting and prosecutions, it always concerns me about the low level of reports on disability. And you've just given one one good reason why that might be. People just don't know that there is such a, an offence. So it is, it, it's so much about raising the awareness. I mean, what I can do is just give an example of, of how reporting has increased over the last few years and some of the questions I've been asked over the last couple of years about it. I can only talk for Wakefield, but it is sort of mirrored across most of West Yorkshire. But if I was to say that hate crime reporting had doubled in the last three years, you might say, well, OK, is that good or a bad thing? I'll give you the numbers just briefly. So in 2017, we had approximately 500 hate incidents reported in Wakefield District. So you're talking one and a half incidents reported per day. In 2020 so far, we're looking at about a thousand being reported. So that's double the number of incidents reported to the police in three years. Now, I remember in 2018, we went up from about 500 to about 700. And my bosses came to me and said, Richard, we're really concerned. What's going wrong in Wakefield? Why is hate crime going up 30 percent in 12 months? You know, are there lots of groups of people out there uh, assaulting people, abusing people? And I turned around and said, well, actually, I'm really pleased it's gone up 30% in 12 months. I am really pleased it's gone up 100% in three years. 
because what has happened is we have specific people encouraging reporting. It's not because there are necessarily more incidents happening. It's probably because we've got more people willing to tell us what's going on, willing to report those incidents. And the people that talk to us now will say, this has been going on for years. I've just never bothered telling you about it because it has become a part of my life. It's what I'm used to on a day to day basis. I didn't think you'd be interested and I didn't think anything would happen if I did tell you. So the fact that we've gone out and actively encouraged people to do it does get the word around. People do then increase their faith in the, in the justice system. They do want to tell us about things. So when I was able to put that back to my bosses and say, actually, I'm really happy about this increase, they looked at it and went, actually, yeah, we understand. So I think if we understand the reason for that increase, that we haven't had a massive rise in hate abuse across the district, what we have is an increase in community confidence in telling us what's going on and giving us the opportunity to deal with some of it. It's exactly right. You know, it sounds quite perverse, doesn't it, when you say it's a good thing that the reports have been increasing. And it is certainly down to raising the awareness. But what we do know is that there is even more out there. This has been going on for years and years. It just hasn't been reported. And I think going back to the disability hate crime and and the low figures on that, I do wonder as well whether or not there is a feeling within the disability community that They've always put up with these um, terrible remarks that have been made to them. They've had it all their lives and they just they just accept it now and they shouldn't be. And that's what it's about, making them realise that they should report it. It's important and they will be supported when they do. The other thing that we need to make sure people understand is, is the confidentiality of it, because we had feedback that people weren't reporting hate incidents because several years ago, some of them were accidentally outed by the police. So people who may have sexual orientation or or gender identity that's different from from usual, their family might not have been aware of it. Their neighbours might not have been aware of it. So if they report a crime with a perception of sexual orientation, and we then go and speak to the next door neighbour and say, your neighbour's reported the fact you've made comments about him being gay, and the neighbour goes, I didn't even know he was gay. We then outed that person without them giving us permission to do that. So we had that with some of the trans community as well who said, we don't want to report things to the police because we think you'll tell all and sundry about it, you'll out us to our neighbours, to our community. We don't want you to do that. We will keep things confidential. That's the important part about people who, if they do report incidents to us and say, actually, I do not want the police to come round to my home address. I do not want you to write letters to me because my partner, my family might receive that correspondence instead. We'll, We'll agree with that. We will agree to that confidentiality. There's lots of different ways for reporting as well. So it's not just a case of people ringing up the police, ringing up 101 and giving all their details. There's lots of confidential ways of reporting. So we've got Stop Hate UK, where people can do it online. They can do it through apps. You can report it online through the police website, through the council website. There's lots of other organisations that can report on people's behalf. And that gives them that confidence that if they don't want to interact directly with the police, they can do it through a third party if they want to. Because part of that definition is perceived by the victim or any other person. So you can report a hate crime on behalf of a family member, a friend, a relative. We even get people, believe it or not, reporting hate crimes for something they see on TV or they see on social media where they're not impacted on directly themselves, but because they've read something and they realise that it's a hate crime, they will report it on behalf of other people. You're listening to Can You Hear Me? The West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network podcast. How do you think staff that work within an NHS or a social care setting, whether that be in a hospital or in community, can be supported? Can you... Tell us how you work with groups and communities to ensure that people do report, and particularly within this setting where access to service might be a crucial thing for the individual's well-being. Yeah, the first aspect of that is, as I mentioned earlier, about people being aware that it is an offence to be treated in that way. So if if you're in a caring uh, position and you have a patient who is making comments uh, against you because of the colour of your skin, because of clothing you might wear, because of the way you might speak, people might often think, well, that is just a normal way of life, that that's not something that's unusual. They always make a comment about the black member of staff that's come in the room again. 
or a racial comment that's made against someone. So that's the first barrier to overcome is the fact that you have to realise that you are being a victim of hate crime and you can tell us whatever's gone on and we will take it from there in terms of how we might deal with that. There's a very important aspect with people, particularly in the caring services in the NHS, in hospitals, is that quite often they don't want to report incidents to us because they have some sort of sympathy with the patient or they don't want to get the patient in trouble, particularly in sort of mental health settings where staff are being assaulted quite regularly by patients. There's quite often racial abuse involved within that. But their stance is, well, I don't want to get them in trouble. They're not well. They're not very healthy people mentally. Or it could be physical illness where, you know, they've got um, quite a severe illness and I don't want the police giving them, you know, hassle, whatever you want to call it, over having a report made about it. I don't want them to get in trouble. Now, I can understand why people might feel like that. Firstly, that doesn't need to stop them from telling us about it. If that is their honest concern and they don't want that person speaking to, we will abide by that wish. We will follow that victim's wish as to how they want it dealing with. But we're also very interested in building pictures up over time. So where we have a particular patient, for example, who is abusing one member of staff and then the following week they abuse another member of staff, that could culminate within a few weeks time. A number of people within that setting feeling very uncomfortable, very upset, not wanting to work there. People could end up deciding to work in different locations, pressurised into going elsewhere. You could also end up with quite a serious incident at the end of it. So what we want to do is build up that picture of the, the way the patient deals with people. It allows it to be recorded internally. There are systems within most organisations to record things without having to tell the police. It builds up that intelligence picture about that, that patient. So at least you're, you're forewarned about something potentially happening with them. It allows staff to protect themselves a little bit. And if it comes to eventually having a serious incident occurring, it allows us to provide a background that's led up to it to show that it's not just a one-off. So we're quite happy to record stuff and we will work with the CPS on these if there is a serious incident showing the history of what the patient has done throughout the weeks building up to it to show about how their mental capacity might come into it. That needs to be judged from a medical aspect. And it's about reassuring people that they can tell us. Another aspect of that is to make sure that management are behind it because we want management to support staff in coming and reporting incidents. We want to ensure that all these locations have processes in place where members of staff feel comfortable that they can go to um, a colleague, to a supervisor and tell them what's happened, that it will be recorded appropriately, that they won't be snubbed and pushed away and told to get over it. It doesn't matter. We want that management support. And we also need that management support when it comes to going down the route of prosecutions. We need to have an organisation that's behind the individual telling them that it's OK to work with the police, telling them it's OK for us to come to the location to take statements, to start dealing with the patients if there's an offence being committed. So that's a big chunk of it is to make sure that there is an organisational support behind the individual, encouraging them to report incidents. Gail, one of the questions that I'd like to ask is around sometimes there are cases where we have religion as a concept that the hate crime is about and sometimes race and sometimes the two are entwined together. If a case arrives to the CPS, how would you address both issues or would you just address one of the issues? The legislation, there is, um, as I'm sure you'll know, the specific uh, racially and religiously aggravated offences. There are a certain number of offences where that applies. So you can have a, a racially aggravated assault, for example, or religiously aggravated harassment, and they are already in the statute. They are specific offences and you can be um, sentenced to a greater sentence for that. There is nothing stopping a prosecutor charging more than one strand of a hate crime. You quite often get a sense when you're looking at these cases or reading the evidence as to where the hostility really lies. And it often comes from the comments that are made by the perpetrator. So, you know, you can charge more than one offence if they are separate. If they are completely interlinked, then I think it's a case of, as I've said, you know, determining from the, the actual words that have been used and the hostility that's been demonstrated against the victim to determine which one is probably most appropriate. Do you feel like hate crime prosecutions have declined? And if they have, what could contribute to this? Our role kicks in, if you like, once the police have referred a file to us. If the case doesn't come to us, we can't prosecute it. And that might be for very good reasons. 
there are many cases that are reported based on the perception by the victim, by a witness, by anybody who's there, or even by a police officer. It might not be mentioned, but a police officer might read the case and think, I believe this is a hate crime. But when the police complete their investigation, before they can send it to us, they need to be satisfied that there is sufficient evidence. Now, if the offence is based on perception, it wouldn't be a hate crime. You have to have evidence to prove that element of the offence. Let's take a crowded high street, for example, um, very busy outside of the shops and uh, an individual starting at the top of the street decides um, they're going to pick a few pockets on their way down. They manage to dip a few bags and take out purses and wallets, etc. There may be, say, four or five victims. One of the victims is an elderly lady who is on crutches because of a disability. One of those individuals might be black. Now, the lady with the disability, not surprisingly, might think on her own that she has been targeted because of her disability. That would be logged as a hate crime. But that case would come through to the CPS because there would be clearly enough evidence on the theft for all of the other individuals as well. And we would have to look at that case and decide, can we prove that this person targeted this lady and stole her purse because she was disabled and you know he showed hostility towards her disability um, that's the key they have to show that we have to be able to prove the hostility and if we have five incidents and they're all different people some without disability some white people then it would be very difficult to prove that he targeted that woman he actually stole from that woman because she was disabled, but there was a hostility about that. It's quite clear that he might have committed the theft because she was vulnerable and she was an easy target, but we have to prove the hostility. So that would account for, for example, reports going to the police being quite high, cases coming to the CPS, and although it would be flagged as a hate crime because the perception is there, we wouldn't get a prosecution of a hate crime. We wouldn't get a conviction, rather, of a hate crime. And we wouldn't be able to ask the court for a sentence uplift on the basis that this was a hate crime. However, if he was going down that same street and he made towards the black man a racist comment and pushed him and grabbed his um, wallet or whatever it was, then that would be different. Um, he has made a specific comment about that person's characteristic and um, we would have some evidence to prove that there was hostility, ill will, anything of that nature towards that particular individual. So it does account for um, the difference that you can quite often see between the number of high reports that the police receive and the number of cases that go to prosecution. Some fall before they even reach the CPS, because the police have realised they haven't sufficient evidence. And it's not just always on perception. It could be, for example, let's say there was a stranger running by and saw an Asian individual, decided she was in his way, and he pushed her, saying, you know, get out of the way with some racist abuse attached to it. That person is a stranger to her, and she didn't get a good look at them. But she's reported it to the police and the police take that on. Obviously, it's, it's a serious offence and they investigate it. The only way they're going to try and get this person is by maybe checking CCTV. They carry out that line of inquiry. The CCTV doesn't help at all. Now, they call, there's no other further lines of inquiry. So they wouldn't have enough to send that case through to the CPS because they couldn't even identify the suspect. So again, that would be a case that would appear in the police figures, but didn't appear in prosecutions. So th there are a number of reasons why that happens. Gail, you touched on uplifts for sentencing. Can yep. you tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. I, I mentioned before, um, Zahida, that there are um, statutory offences for racially and religiously aggravated offences. They were brought in many years ago because it became readily apparent that the court's sentencing powers involving cases where there was a racist or religious element, they didn't have sufficient powers to deal with that aggravating feature, serious aggravating feature. 
and so the the new offences were brought in. And then a few years go by and, you know, becomes apparent again that actually it's not just racially and religiously aggravated offences that are taking place here. There are other areas and characteristics that are being targeted, people being targeted with those characteristics out of, you know, hostility. That's where the hate crime legislation was amended again to allow a sentence uplift where anybody who committed a crime and either immediately before, during or immediately after committing the crime. So if it's an assault, um, somebody makes some comment about the individual being gay, for example, that person will be charged with an assault. Now, there isn't a specific offence of being prejudiced against gays. You have the, the assault only. And this is why it was changed, because um, there was no legislation for it. But when that person, defendant now, because they've been charged with that assault, goes before the court, it's the duty of the prosecutor. It should firstly, with the police, be flagged as a hate crime, because it is. Then when it comes to the CPS, we will flag it as a hate crime. And then when it goes to court, it is the duty of the prosecutor um, at the point of sentence to raise with the court that this is a hate crime and that the sentencing person should take that into account and um, impose an uplift on sentence. So, for example, given that assault, the courts are supposed to announce it in a, a two-staged approach. So they, if it's a common assault, for example, in the magistrate's court, um, the magistrates would say, you're guilty of this assault, as a, a straight assault on another person, um, you would get two months in prison for this. However, this is a hate crime and we are going to uplift that sentence because of the hostility you showed towards this gentleman based on his sexual orientation and you will now receive four months imprisonment. And, and that, for me, announcing it in that way is so important so that the public can hear it in the courtroom, any journalists who are there can report on it, and the communities can then read this and see that it is worth reporting, that it does make a difference. It's not just an assault, it's a hate crime, and they will be punished accordingly. You're listening to Can You Hear Me? podcast from the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership Bain Network. What can we within the health and social care sector do, bearing in mind that when we look at our staff survey results and feedback that we get about what our our patients or our customers or our clients or service users are saying to us that are impacting on on us as members of staff that could be an incident or a crime. It's important when you get information from staff surveys, we we all do them and they're all very important uh, because that's where we learn. What we also need to find out from them quite often is why why the response is the way it is. If we're not given comments in a staff survey, then that makes it difficult and we have to establish how we're going to um, elicit those comments. There are ways, obviously, working with the staff, getting the information from the staff survey. If explanations are given there as to why, if they were a victim of um, a hate crime, they didn't report it, then that's valuable information. And, you know, at the CPS, we have been recently holding local talks with communities, in particular black communities, as well as Asian and minority ethnics. And it was to get the community view in relation to all of hate crime, but in particular, it was the, the racist element of it. And it's doing things like that, that educate us so that we can try and work out ways as to how we can improve on reporting. So I think as an organisation, it's very important, you know, that we have a team set up to look into this. We have an, an SM senior management team, but we have a shadow team that we are setting up from our inclusion and community engagement group so that we have 
a diverse team who can advise the SMT if there are any, any relevant issues like that. But it's also, it's about the encouragement and it's very important that the management aren't seen to be a barrier. Do we know why staff aren't reporting? What are they saying that the reasons for not proceeding? And I think it's right, it might be if it is a patient, they don't want to get them into trouble, they're not very well and such like. But is it about confidence in the criminal justice system? And if that's the case, then then we need to do better in improving that public confidence. And that's why, you know, we do these public events. That's why, you know, we're speaking to you today, because it's important that everybody out there, including the NHS staff, understand that if a if a report is made, it will be taken very seriously. And I think the other side of it is the support that we can give. Many people will be terrified about going to court and giving evidence. And the Crime Prosecution Service, we have to think about that when we're preparing a case to go to trial. We need to know whether or not that witness needs any additional support. And the police give us that information. And if we need to apply for what we call special measures to help them give the best standard of evidence that they can, then we will make that application. So, for example, they could have apply for screens, to have a screen around them when they're giving evidence in court. They can go and visit the court beforehand so they can familiarise themselves with it and understand how it's going to feel before they go in there. And th there are many other applications that can be made. And, you know, victim support are excellent in that regard, regularly keeping in touch with victims and witnesses, because it is so important if somebody does have the confidence and the courage to come forward to report this, that we keep them engaged. Because quite often we might get as far as charging and start the prosecution process, but they decide that they no longer want to attend or it was so long ago that, you know, we, we, we don't want to attend court anymore. And so we have to keep them engaged. So it is important that we have that regular contact with them. So it, it is, it's not just about the NHS within the NHS, you know, giving avenues to people for the reporting um, and, le and letting them know they'll be supported. You know, both the police and the CPS also work very closely together um, to build public confidence in this area of hate crime. So that hopefully, if that is one of the reasons why they're not coming forward, that will hopefully change. It shouldn't be seen as part of the job. It shouldn't be an expected glitch in your day that you just have to put up with and walk away from. You know, it's the same as any other uh, environment. You walk into a shop, it will say anybody who abuses staff will be reported to the police. You'll be asked to leave. If you go into most organisations, they have some sort of policy around threats to staff and they take a stance with it. There's nothing, and it includes the police. We report hate crimes against us. There's an awful lot of officers who are abused at different situations um, because of any of the strands that they might meet. And they're as entitled to report a hate crime as anyone else is. And the same goes for NH staff and caring staff, is you don't have to put up with it. You can take some action about it. Quite often I'm asked the question, what is the point in telling you about what's gone on? And it's a really important one. People need to care. People need to tell us what's going on. It supports colleagues as well as supporting themselves, because if people see colleagues reporting hate crimes, they're more likely to report them themselves. The family will pick that on board and say, yes, we agree with you and you'll get family support and they might then report. And we've got to know what's happening to build up that bigger picture. So it does sound a little bit bleak sometimes. We're not trying to do that. What we're trying to explain is sometimes it doesn't always go to plan. Sometimes we don't always do what people want us to do. They might ring up and report a, a very low level minor public order with no suspect and then get really disappointed when we explain we're not going to find this person. We want to hopefully get people to understand how that decision is made, what that process is about. And one of the things that we do is we give that support to any individual, whether they want prosecutions or not. So we have a hate crime coordinator who is a police officer that purely deals with hate crimes. And one of the initial things that she does is every day she looks at whatever hate crime has been reported and she will ring back every single victim, whether they want to prosecute, whether there's any evidence, whether the crime's already been closed without us attending. And she will at least offer that support to that individual because that ultimately is what we're about, is about protecting individuals, giving them the support, giving them the confidence. And it might well be, actually, they feel better just for reporting that incident, regardless if anybody gets prosecuted for it. It actually, they're entitled to do that. They're entitled to stand up for themselves and tell us what's been hurtful. 
And that little bit of support we can give might just make the difference for them to be able to walk away that day with a little bit more confidence than they had previously. If we don't know there's an issue there, we don't interact with that area of the community, we'll never get the confidence in us. They'll never feel supported by the police. So we've got to break down those barriers at some stage. And then it takes time to get people having that confidence, being able to speak to us. And then maybe at some stage they will want to prosecute. It might be they don't want to do it because they have no confidence in the police. So we can't get around that one. You're listening to Can You Hear Me? The West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network podcast. I'm aware across West Yorkshire and Harrogate of third party reporting centres being very local based. What within the public sector, within health and social care, because we have tentacles everywhere, how do you think as public sector organisations we could work on that and and be reporting centres ourselves potentially? You have a, an internal system, I think, is it called Datix, that records um, incidents on a daily basis within health settings. And when we look at the volume of stuff that's been recorded internally, it's massive. There are thousands of incidents where members of staff have been pushed, abused, sworn at, assaulted, kicked, bitten, punched. Very, very few of those are reported to the police. So if somebody says to me, you know, how many assaults take place at Pinderfields, for example, I will give them a, a small number. There might have been, for example, I think maybe 47, I think off the top of my head, for the last 12 months at Pinderfields of staff being assaulted. They then show me the Datix information that says there was 900 internally reported assaults. Now, if they're only internally reported, one, we don't know there's a problem. Two, we'll never have the opportunity to do any prosecutions or take any action against the people involved with it. And how do you report them? Now, I know a recent piece of work has taken place with recording internally because previously you could only report a hate crime. It didn't break it down into any of the strands. So what we've then said is, well, if you're going to report a hate crime, it's really useful actually to be able to tell us what type of hate it is, because that will again help us gear our response towards what's actually happening. So we've we've asked them to change the recording systems internally and break it down into one of the five strands. So at least we can get the data we need to work out which areas we need to concentrate on. Internally, the staff know what they've got a problem with and what's hurting people. So simple things like that about having a good recording system. Now, I'm not saying you need to report all those 900 assaults to the police. There will be a number of reasons why some of those might not be appropriate. I know we get a lot of assaults on staff in places where people have, for example, dementia. You know, it would not fit within the crime world to start investigating dementia patients assaulting staff. But it could well be that you can do internal processes to help protect the staff purely by recording that information. And, you know, we will go in and speak to people even if there's no prosecution taking place, our hate crime coordinator will come into hospitals and speak to patients, not about prosecutions and investigating, but about what's simply right and wrong, about what is inappropriate to speak to staff about and say to staff why certain words or phrases or comments are hurtful. And by the police doing that, it drives it home a little bit more than perhaps an individual saying, actually, I find it hurtful what you've just said to me, is the police come and we have that sort of aura of authority, don't we, to put a message across but we will quite happily do that by doing presentations. I mean, I, I've been to, um, to Fieldhead and Pinderfields doing presentations to staff just to try and break down that barrier to put a face behind the recording process, to encourage people that it's worth picking up the phone, emailing, doing it on the app, using whatever process they have available to do it. And I think there's perhaps more can be done internally within organisations to build those links to get those reports put through. But anybody is capable of emailing a report to us through the internet, through the council, through Stop Hate. There's other organisations out there without actually having to ring 101 or, or speak to a police officer. We'd like you to, but you don't have to. As we're recording this in Hate Crime Awareness Week, Gail, is there any final thoughts that you'd like to give to us about hate crime and the impact that it has or for, for the individual but for us as a society as well. I know that's a biggie to ask, but... No, it is, uh, it is, isn't it? I mean, they're abhorrent crimes and it doesn't just affect the victim, it affects witnesses, their families and the community. They are, this is why the legislation was brought in. It could be, it was evidence that 
this hostility um, now characterised, you know, five strands where hate crime has been introduced. The impact is devastating, absolutely devastating, especially if they feel they're not getting justice. I did a presentation yesterday for Bradford Hate Crime Alliance, and it was explaining how prosecutors make decisions and why sometimes we can't charge a case. And I think that sounds pretty basic, but explaining something like that helps victims who haven't reported maybe understand why they should still report, because it's not because it's not going to be treated seriously. You know, the CPS and the police work very closely together about this, you know, trying to improve on in every way um, the prosecution from beginning to end as far as hate crimes concerned. And, you know, we all understand how badly the impact is. It impacts on, on all of these people and their family, friends and community. So getting out there and explaining how, you know, if they feel we don't care because we don't prosecute, we have to let them know why that happens, why we might not prosecute. And I think giving that explanation, you know, it sort of dawns on them, oh, right, I understand that now. Before, I just thought you didn't care and, and the case wasn't charged or it wasn't investigated. Well, no, we do care. We do take it seriously. And, you know, getting that message out there will hopefully encourage more people um, to come forward and report. And also, you know, we do have some great examples of um, hate crime sentence uplift. And I've been with Yorkshire and Humberside for about 16, 17 months now um, as hate crime coordinator. And when, when I started that role, our regular hate crime performance uplift, sentence uplift on cases um, was between 70 and 75%. And CPS have done an awful lot of work, delivered massive amount of training to every prosecutor. It's mandatory. Even when somebody new comes in, they will have to go on that two day course for hate crime training. And all of that makes a difference to educating the lawyers, educating the advocates as to what they need to do. Um, and even going outside of that because we instruct barristers as well. And really working very hard and closely on this hate crime sentence uplift. We are now achieving between 80 and 85 percent sentence uplift on our cases. We're never going to get 100 percent because of the reasons we've already mentioned, because of um, perception cases. And, you know, there's there are always somewhere the magistrates or the judge won't agree with us. So that 80, 85 percent regularly being achieved now on our sentence uplift is something that, you know, we need to get out there so that the public can hear what efforts are being made. And hopefully that will keep on, you know, increasing the number of people who come to report the crimes. Thank you. And over to Richard. Hey, Crime Awareness Week. I think that the big thing there is the fact that it's not just one week a year. This happens to people on a daily basis, year in, year out. All it does is it gives us the opportunity just to highlight for a short period of time all the good work that's been going on all the way that different organisations, different partnerships are working together to tackle this problem. And it makes that awareness there. And that's the clue in the title. It's the Awareness Week. It's an awareness to the public that hate crime does actually happen. It exists, the impact it has on victims. It's the awareness of people that they themselves can be a victim of hate crime. And also it's an awareness for people who are suspects, offenders, that action can be taken, that it hurts people, that it's not going to be ignored, and that they can actually potentially end up at court. And I've seen some of the stuff that's come out from the CPS. They do send out newsletters with the uplift results on, and it's really impactive. So when we get that sort of information, we do pass that out to other organisations. We make victims aware that it is a real difference to a prosecution by having hate attached to it. The courts take it really seriously, and we need to pass that information out and make people aware of that as well. You've been listening to the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network podcast. Thank you to Gail, Richard and Zahida, and thank you for listening. Join us again next time, and we'll be joined by more diverse talent working to improve health and care for people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate.